Yesterday we uh, had a family reunion in Indiana for my side of, of our family. It's been a while since I've gotten together with uh, my, my cousins and my aunts and uncles. In fact, I, I think it's probably been almost eight years uh, since we were able to attend uh, kind of one of those large scale family events. It was at my aunt and uncle's lake cottage in Northern Indiana. It was just a, it was just a great afternoon just to sit enjoy the, the nice temperatures, the sunshine, catch up with uh, cousins and their kids, watch uh, the little ones kind of run around. And uh, we had three boys that fished off the dock all day, uh, seven years old or so. They were out there for hours and hours, poles in the water constantly. And uh, they didn't catch anything, but I don't, I think it was probably because there were no hooks or, or bait on the end, but, uh, <laughs> They didn't seem to care. They, they were having a good time anyway. Just talking with uh, my cousins, you know, I'd grown up with and catching up uh, with them and uh, hearing about life and all that's going on there. It was, it was just great. Coming home last night, I just felt full, right? I felt like it was just a, a wonderful uh, afternoon for us. And I, I was just pleased with the, the opportunity we had to spend time together. Today we're going to look at a new topic. Going, continuing in our series, that's not what the Bible says, that, that feels like I felt yesterday afternoon. Just full. Happy with life. Life could not have been better. We've, we've had a, a full summer, the kids being home, and we've been able to do some things uh, kind of with them, and it's just it's just been a great summer. But, but there have also been some hard pieces in the summer, and so we've navigated those as well. And, and if you're like me, you lean into those pleasant experiences and times, and you tend to want to wanna run from the unpleasant ones. And today's, today's conversation comes from something that I hear in Christian circles uh, fairly regularly. In fact, several years ago, when we were taking topics for the U.S. for its series, uh, this was specifically requested to, to talk about this particular idea or belief or thought. The thought that God desires above most other things for us to be happy, for us to be blessed, for us to be prosperous. This idea that a, a good and a loving and a, a generous God would, would pour his blessings on us is, is common. We see throughout the scriptures that God does do that, that he constantly is blessing his people, that he's protecting them, that he's, he's carrying them along and, and pouring, showering us with blessings. So what's the problem with us carrying a belief that we serve a good and loving and generous God who wants us to be happy? The problem isn't that, that we believe this. It's, it's that we carry it to the end, to a place that it's, it's not actually supported by Scripture. When we, when we overemphasize uh, this thought. Quite often, I hear this verse quoted in line with this thinking. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Uh, some of you just hearing the reference know the verse and have probably played it out in your mind. We're going to spend a lot of time in Jeremiah 29 this morning. Because it's important for us to, to learn to appropriately balance our assumptions about who God is and how he reveals and shares his, his immense goodness with us. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I listened to another message and they, in line with Jeremiah 29 and other thoughts about God being generous and kind and good to his people quoted Psalm 97 2, quoted it this way, may all who are godly be happy. Uh, I was curious, so I, I looked up Psalm 97 12 in, in my Bible, and it didn't read exactly that way. So then I 
I grabbed another Bible off my shelf, a different version, and I found Psalm 97, 12, and looked it up there, and I didn't read that one. So I grabbed a third Bible, uh, another translation, and it still didn't read that way. So, so then, now I'm curious, so I, I started diving into the scriptures online where I had more access to broader, uh, a broader scope or library of versions of the Bible. I finally found that Psalm 97, 12, written, may all who are godly be happy, comes from the New Living Bible. It's, a, it's not a translation, but a paraphrase of the Bible. Uh, a biblical scholar who read the scriptures and then put into his own words what he saw there. Uh, a paraphrase. As I, as I thought about God wanting us to be happy, it started to raise questions for me. But what happens if I'm not happy? Does that, does that then mean that I'm outside of God's will? Uh, what if my happiness and your happiness don't align? What if my happiness makes you unhappy? Then which one of us now must be living outside of, of God's perfect plan for us? Does God only ever want us to be happy? What, what happens if what makes me happy in the moment seems to go against the things that the scriptures teach? That what if my happiness means now that God is unhappy? You see, questions start to arise when we deal with the behaviors and habits and, and indulgences that, that maybe make me happy but, but make someone else unhappy or, or even worse, cause harm to another person. I, I've seen lots and lots of marriages fall apart over the years because one or other of the spouse engaged in behaviors that were damaging to that relationship. They got themselves involved in, in an extramarital affair. When asked how could something like this happen, they, they almost always say, I just wasn't happy. We, we see people engage in other behaviors. They, take in through entertainment, through song, or television, or, or movies, all kinds of vulgarities. But, but it's so funny sometimes. I found myself just enjoying the moment, and I know it wasn't great, but, but if I'm laughing, then it, it seems that we're willing to make concessions about what we bring into our, our eyes and our ears. You see, when we start talking about God wanting us to be happy, when we use the scriptures to, to support the idea that, that one of God's highest priorities is for his people to enjoy life, to, to be prosperous in, in what they do, and, and to be happy, you will find that anytime someone is using that as their end and finding scriptures to, to support that, that I must always take those scriptures out of context, like Psalm 97, 12, paraphrased and, and not even quoting the entire verse in this case, which actually says in most versions something much closer to rejoice in the Lord. You who are righteous and praise his holy name, it has very little to, to do with us being happy, but if we, we paraphrase it, we can flip it on its head. And imply that, that the end of humanity is for us to be happy. This thinking leads to, to theologies like the prosperity gospel that, that imply or teach directly that, that we as God's people are meant to prosper and be successful in all that we do. And as long as we're people of faith, God will bless those those efforts that we, we make in our churches and in our businesses and as parents. And if we're not being blessed, then, then we must be off the trail somewhere. We must be doing something wrong if life isn't going the way we want. If life doesn't just find itself being prosperous in all that we do. This thinking, this thinking the problem with it is that it, it reduces God to some sort of divine vending machine. And it, it reduces our relationship 
with him to, to being merely transactional. We give God something, our allegiance, time in prayer, our faithful tithe at church. We use Christianese language when we're in public so that the people hear about him. We, we give God something, expecting that then, then he gives us something in return. His blessing, that that, that which we do prospers. And, and it's a back and forth, and we, we start to buy into this idea that, that our relationship with him is, is just for this kind of symbiotic mutual benefit. And we forget that the God of the universe is completely self-sufficient in all that he is. He, he doesn't need any benefit from us. It elevates us and reduces him to, to be equal partners in this relationship with him. We see in the scriptures as we read through the Old Testament that, that when God's people came to that place in their faith, the relationship they had with him was, was crumbling under, underneath their feet. In fact, Jeremiah 29, 11, that is so often used to advance this thought, comes at a time in, of, in history where where we see God dealing with his people because of such thinking. You see, they had started to rely on all of those blessings that God had, had bestowed on them. His people began to rely on the covenant that God had made with Abraham and promised to his descendants. They, they believed that that God had made these promises to bless and prosper them, to, in fact, bless the whole world through them, that, that they felt a little bit invincible, even though they, they had broken their side of the arrangement. They were worshiping other gods. They weren't being faithful to the one true God that had made this invitation, who had offered this invitation of relationship with them. They, they relied on the covenant rather than the one who had made it with them. They, they began to lean into and find security in the, the kings and the priests that God had established to bring order to, to their community, to their nation. They thought as long as we have a, a king on the throne who, who is godly, we're, we're okay, we're, we're all set. As long as we continue to interact with the priests and make our sacrifices, God would never allow calamity to fall on us. They relied on, on the established systems and structures rather than the one who had commanded them. They believed that God had given them the land of Canaan. It had been promised to Abraham. They, they had read the stories of conquest under Joshua's leadership and Caleb's leadership. They had established firmly the kingdom under King David in the land of Canaan. They, they believed that God would never turn his back on, on that region of the world. And certainly he wouldn't allow pagan, heathen people like the Babylonians to sweep in and, and to recapture Canaan. Certainly not the holy city of Jerusalem where God's very temple stood. They relied on the temple, the structure that Solomon had built, where they worshipped, where God's presence dwelt. God would never allow the city of Jerusalem and the temple to be, to be destroyed. That's where he lived. Certainly, they, they had God in their corner to protect his own house, so to speak. You see, the country, the nation of Israel had begun to rely on, on those things that God had offered them to, to establish and strengthen their relationship with him. Those things that God had given them to, to bless them in their lives, they relied on those gifts, on those blessings. They found their security in all of those rather than the God of the universe who had offered them. I hear language like that today. We live in a country established on Christian principles. Certainly, God will bless America. Even though our daily lives certainly don't reflect the righteousness that God desires from us. You see, we, we want to have something, some 
measurable transactional relationship so that if we do our things, we can be guaranteed that God will do his part. But, but the problem with that thinking is that, that when God starts talking about prosperity with his people, he's talking about something so much more than our financial stability or, or our physical health or, or political structures. And so we look at Jeremiah chapter 29 this morning. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn there. Again, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. But let's ask ourselves, who exactly is is God speaking to when he offers this promise? Speaking to the Israelites at the time of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah lived at a time when the Babylonian Empire had risen to incredible power. They were sweeping all around the Middle East and what would later become parts of the, the Roman world. The, the Babylonians were a ruthless people. They had come to the land of Canaan. They had laid siege to their people and the cities found there. In fact, the, the nobles and, and those who were in power had already been carried off to Babylon as slaves to be made eunuchs and servants of Babylonian rulers and magistrates. The, the working order, the Babylonians had come back and, and taken from Canaan those of kind of middle age, the, the working class people. They had taken them as slaves as well, returned them to other areas within their kingdom to kind of drive the economy of this, this rising Babylonian power as they waged war against other nations as well and secured <clears throat> their borders. The people Jeremiah is talking to have seen their neighbors killed and massacred in war. <laughs> They've had friends and family members carried off to serve as slaves in a foreign nation far from home. Their systems and structures, their freedoms and kind of autonomy was, was destroyed already. These are not a happy people. These are people who have seen the atrocities of war, who have lost people that they cared about deeply and, and loved Deep, love deeply. And, and to this group of people, God says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. But they had already experienced so much harm. And were wondering, who, who is this God and, and what has he done for us lately? They were struggling in their faith. They they had abandoned him over generations, only coming back to him from time to time for a season. He's writing to people who were struggling. And the promise, I know the plans for you, are, are followed with a timeline. God tells his people in these middle chapters of the book of Jeremiah, that, that they will, in fact, be subject to the Babylonians for the next 70 years. And so this promise, I, I can't help but think, maybe falls on, on deaf ears a bit. God is promising that he will prosper them 70 years down the road if that type of promise came to you or I. I would have something to look forward to when I was almost 120 years old. See, the promise isn't for me. The promise is for the next generation. I, I won't see the goodness that God is promising, the, the restoration of our nation and our principles and our lifestyles, the opportunity for us to prosper and build wealth and live out the American dream, if, if this promise comes to me for 70 years down the road, I might just think, what's the point? 
I've seen so much death and destruction and heartache. God, I appreciate that you promise blessing for someone else, but, but what good is that for me in my life? That's the audience in Jeremiah chapter 29. You see, here's the... Here's the truth that's, that's difficult for us to, to not maybe understand, but certainly to embrace. God promises lots of things in the scriptures. They're, they're packed full of his promises. Unfortunately, happiness isn't one of them. He doesn't guarantee that to his people. What are the truths concerning God's promises of blessing and prosperity and happiness? We need to understand, first and foremost, that, that sometimes as we read through history, Old and New Testament alike, that sometimes God's plans will actually make us very unhappy. Sometimes God's plans are the last thing we want to do. Several years ago, Sarah and I were just in our first couple years of, of ministry. Not far from here. We're serving a church. It was going really well. The, the people felt like our kind of people. We loved the community. The, the youth ministry was growing. And we, we just had students that we adored. And uh, it, it was a wonderful place to serve in the church. And we got a phone call asking us to consider coming to, to serve at a, a different church. We began praying about it and felt very clearly that God was calling us to, to leave a ministry that we loved for a ministry we didn't know that much about. But in order to be obedient, we, we agreed and, and we moved. <laughs> it didn't take us very long, within a couple months, to realize we didn't, didn't enjoy the people like we, we did at the, the previous place. Uh, the, the relationship I had with the senior pastor at that church was, was, wasn't was very healthy. Uh, there was a constant tension and uncertainty. We, he didn't trust me, and, and I didn't really trust him very much, and it, it created a, a really kind of caustic dynamic in, in the office. We found ourselves struggling over the next months to the point where I was often sick. I, breaking out in hives and not sleeping well at night and I just I was constantly under under stress and yet we knew we were exactly where God had called us we were confident and certain this is what we were supposed to do and he, he continued to to reinforce that through conversations that we had and scriptures that were brought to light at different times that that seemed probably from the outside to be random, but they were at just the perfect moments for us to encourage us to, to stay the course. And it was a very difficult season of ministry. Looking back on it, I still have no doubt that that's exactly where we were supposed to be in that season, even though it was unpleasant to say the least. We were not happy. And, and we know that it was God's plan. And I, I see here, as God speaks to the people through the prophet Jeremiah, that sometimes... This is true. His plans might make us very unhappy. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4, God says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. The God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Why were God's people in exile? He tells us in this verse, God carried his people into exile. You see, the, the Babylonian Empire wasn't an ungodly pagan people just happening to thumb their nose at God's people and his promises to them that they would, they would live and dwell in the land of Canaan and, and somehow overpowering God's plans. This was God's plan. This was what God was allowing to happen. God carried his people into exile. He had reasons for doing so. Unhappiness doesn't necessarily mean failure on your part or God's. Parents, 
do you want, generally speaking, do you want your children to be happy? Sure you do. Uh, I want my children to be happy for them and for me. Life is so much pleasant, more pleasant when my children are happy. Parents, do you also want your children to be healthy? Of course you do. Do you want your parents, or parents, do you want your kids to grow up being men and women of character and substance? When, when you go to meet their teachers at, at the school here in just several weeks for parent-teacher conferences, do you care about their behavior, that, that they handle themselves appropriately while they're away from you at school? Yes, you, you want those things for and from your children, but, but what happens when their health or their character mean that maybe they won't be happy in a situation? Does happiness always trump health? My kids, when they were little, would would eat chicken nuggets and macaroni and cheese every meal if we allowed it. They certainly were more happy eating those things than, than green beans or Brussels sprouts or pick any other vegetable for that matter. I, I'm certain that, that when I was growing up in school, my, my teacher's assignments and, and homework, they never made me happy. Oh, good, I was hoping we could read more on the, the Revolutionary War tonight. I didn't get near enough of that yesterday. I'd much rather do that than go play with my friends or compete in some sporting event this evening. History always made me so happy. My doctor's prescriptions the last time I saw him. Josh, you could probably stand to lose 20 to 30 pounds. You need to change your eating habits. Yeah! <laughs> Who's excited now? Makes me so happy to think about, about what I have to do in order to get there. My parents' discipline never made me happy growing up. I'm certain of it. But I'm so grateful for it now. You see, my happiness wasn't the, the most important priority for my teachers, for my parents, for those who are giving physical care to me now. The book of James says, consider pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I've heard that verse a hundred times. I think it's true. I'm still not sure that I feel pure joy when I face trials of many kinds. I can consider it pure joy because I know what comes out of it, James says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and he goes on from there. So, so maybe you aren't happy with your current situation right now. If you're not happy with where you live or where you work, perhaps where you attend church, where you feel that God has placed you in this moment, if it doesn't make you happy, what, what hope is there? Let's continue looking at the story of the people in the book of Jeremiah. He moves on from, from verse 4, where God says, I carried you in, into exile. Verses 5 and 6, God says, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. You know these verses tell me? That, that even if the situation isn't exactly how you, you would desire it. If the schedule and the, the position isn't as you would write it. This, this passage tells me that there can be blessing even in our disappointment. That there can be beauty in our struggle. Look at the things God tells his people to focus on and to do. The people who have been carried off to a foreign nation, who have been mutilated in some cases, who are enslaved in many cases, or those still left in Jerusalem, wondering what will happen next. What does life look for us now? Build houses. Plant gardens. Get married. 
of children. Watch your children grow to be married themselves. Welcome grandchildren into life. These are, these are some of life's greatest joys. In the midst of in the midst of living under the oppression of the Babylonian Empire, wicked, terrible people, God says, there's, there's space for you to thrive. Not just to get through, but, but to truly live and thrive in this life, to enjoy the, the most beautiful blessings that this world has to offer. You can still do that, even in a situation that seems hopeless, full of despair and pain. And God goes on from that. He says, the blessing is not just for you. Verse 7 says, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. It's a very difficult command. <clears throat> Those who have destroyed your way of life. Look and seek the peace and the prosperity to the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. There is prosperity in praying for your enemies in this moment, God says. So maybe your job isn't awesome. Perhaps Hillsdale wouldn't be your first choice. There is opportunity. There's op opportunity wherever we are to create safe spaces of rest, to enjoy the, the profits of our efforts, to, to love those, to truly look to invest in for the, the benefit of those that, that we interact with on a daily basis. To love them as God loves them and, and to be loved as well. The Apostle Paul, while imprisoned, writes to the Philippian church. After being beaten repeatedly, left to, to rot in his cell, he says to the Philippian church, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. It's important to understand and to know, well, this is all happening for the people under the oppression of the Babylonian Empire. There were those speaking into their lives saying, you, you don't need to be depressed and overwhelmed by all of this. Good days are coming and coming quickly. You see, there were prophets telling the people what they wanted to hear. And God warns his people, yes, this is what the Lord Almighty says, the God of Israel. Do not let the prophets and the diviners among you deceive you. Don't listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. You see, they, they tell you what you want to hear, God is saying. They're prophesying lies to you in my name. If you're in a difficult season, happiness isn't guaranteed. But you still can thrive and benefit in it. You can experience God's power and his, his privilege in those difficult circumstances. You can see him act as perhaps you've never seen him before. And that's the whole point of all of it. You see, we rely so often on the gifts. And when the gifts are lame, we get frustrated and upset. But the Bible tells us that, that the giver is so much greater than any of the gifts. This is real prosperity. This is what God truly desires for us when he says, I have plans for you. Plans to prosper you. What he's talking about is his relationship with each of us. I know the plans I have for you, the Lord says. In verse 11. And then in verses 12 and 13, he explains it. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me. 
and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. This is really what God desires more than anything else. He, he doesn't need our allegiance, but he desires our heart. He wants us to come to him. He wants us to lean in to him. King David says it this way in Psalm 16. I'll finish with this. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Father God, we, we rest in those promises. We <laughs> take delight in the prayer of your faithful servant, David, who understood <coughs> that we truly rejoice. We truly find our gladness. We, we find that prosperity is in your presence. When we find and seek you for who you are, when we see your face and rely on it before we desire that which comes from your hand. God, we, we understand that what we have been made for, to thrive from, is not just the stuff that we run into or collect or accumulate here in this life. We were made for you. We were made for interaction and for your presence. God, may our hearts be filled when we find ourselves in that space. Whether the circumstances and the situations around us are pleasant or difficult, desired or bring us despair, God, may we, may we truly find happiness knowing that we walk through them, through them all with you. Turn our hearts, tune our hearts to sing your praises within your presence. Amen.
to heal my heart and change my name forever free I'm not the same I think the master I think the savior I think God Are you hurting and broken within overwhelmed by the weight of sin Jesus is calling have you come to the end of self do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regret. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to.
shines for all to see your name your name is victory all praises will rise to Christ our King your name your name is victory all praise Our King. The fear that held us now gives way to Him who is our being. His final breath upon the cross is now a She's a 